Hi and welcome to the Sunday Sports Show. I'm Brefni Early. And I'm Claire Kyo. Thanks for joining us. We're broadcasting live today from the DCTV studios in Temple Bar. Yep, and we're going to be taking an in-depth look at what's happening on the sports scene across the city, the county and a little bit further afield. Later on in the show, we're going to be talking to Mullingar man, Ireland's deck Ironman, Jerry Duffy. We're going to meet Railway Union, Evan Sandiment. And we'll also be talking to Gavin Noble, who we're going to put to a little bit of a different triathlon test. But first up, we send Sunday sports correspondent Elaine Caffrey out to DCU to meet the men's Olympic handball team to see how they're getting on with this developing sport. This week, I dropped by DCU to catch up with the Irish men's Olympic handball team. Earlier in the week, they took on both Belgium and Estonia in the bid to qualify for the 2016 European Championships. Before the Games took place, we had the opportunity to meet with some of the players and the coaching staff to see how their preparations are going in time for the game. We have kind of a real good support system around us and we've been doing lots of work in the gym. Um, we're a developing team, so we have to do lots and lots of work, uh, both in the gym, on the court, and kind of in our free time as well. So. And has the team been together, the, like the amount of guys that you have now on the squad, have you been together for a while? Um, not so much, maybe. It's a really young team, so okay. I think the average, aim, uh, average age of our team is around about maybe 21, 22. Um, so we're quite a young team, but we've been working hard the last few months together. So. We're not really focusing so much on the result, more on kind of our own performances, um, both as a team and, and as individuals. Um, as I said, we're kind of a developing nation within Hannibal, so um, it's more about us working and, and trying to, to perform personally um, and, and our own kind of improvements as a team, really, so much as the result. The results would be nice yeah. to try and get closer maybe than some of our past results, but more on the performance of our team, really. Okay, and how's the preparation been going? Yeah, pretty well. We've, we've had some uh, nasty morning sessions, but uh, we've got beyond those. I think we're doing okay with them. So you're getting put yeah. to your faces? Uh, 7 o'clock on a Wednesday is never, never a good time, but uh, yeah, I think we're doing okay. Okay, that's good. Best of luck to you and the guys. So obviously, Olympic handball isn't one of the most mainstream sports in Ireland. Is there a particular reason why you were drawn towards it? Uh, well, actually, I went through the Green Giants talent transfer program. Uh, last summer so I went across from basketball where I played for underage national teams and I just took to it like fish to water it was great fun it's like all the lads are brilliant on the team and it's a real it's a really open sport like everybody that was playing and everybody really wants more people to come and play so once I had started I was able to was at like three or four training sessions a week just being able to keep going and build on everything that I was learning so it was just it's just a great sport to play. So the most I guess you need transition from basketball yeah, there's, into there's a lot of um, transferable skills that you have, like just jumping, the defense is sort of the same, just a little bit more physical, so it's still, there's a lot of things that can come across. So how has the preparation been, like, I suppose training-wise, is it a bit similar or is it a little bit different? It is a little bit different now, it's uh, more physical than, really? than basketball anyway, yeah, handball, you can really get stuck in and like push people around and grab onto each other and like kind of throw people to the ground some of the yeah. time, like it gets, it gets a little bit more fun, you're not getting caught with fouls and stuff, but um, it is the same sort of uh, build up to different matches and stuff like when you have a big match up coming up in any sport you're trying to get your mindset in really have be mentally ready for it and just try to go out and play the best but best game you possibly can and of course these are huge games uh, qualifiers for 2016 is there anything in particular that you're kind of focusing on going into these games we're all just trying to focus on having like a real proper team game like that we have no brilliant star on the team where like the only way we're going to win a match or going to play well is if we play well as a team so we really we have team goals that we're trying to set out like whether whatever happens in the match just to keep going and play in like two minute segments just that every single ball that comes just play it like it's a new ball every time so, so are you hoping for a big crowd here this week i would be brilliant if we could like it's a great facility here in dcu so if we could if we could pack it out it would be really, really brilliant like. tell me would you like to tell us i suppose about what's coming up this week for your team and how the preparations be going yeah, the, the players have worked a lot in the last in the last month, not just in the last week, in the last month they were uh, made a lot of training sessions at 7 o'clock in the morning by their mm -hmm. own and with Yannick with some coaches that help us and also at the same at the gym and just this week has to be an opportunity to show to all the people this commitment and this, this work that they made in the last in the last month. So you're obviously you're coming across from Barcelona and yeah. you're, you're coaching the guys here What's the difference like when you come here and see how this is an obviously developing sport here in Ireland and obviously an established one in Spain? Yeah, the biggest difference is 
uh, we have a lot of facilities there to, to practice handball. We have a lot of holes. They start to practice handball at the school when they are just six or seven years old. I think it's, it's similar. There are some similarities around rugby in Spain and rugby in, in Ireland. Perhaps the, the, the level of the rugby in Spain is the same that the level of uh, handball here in, in Ireland. This is the reason that we want to, to improve that and we want to, to show to the young kids that this isn't a sport that I'm sure that they, they like it, but we need more holes and we need more facilities to, to do it. Yeah, and, and obviously maybe a lot of people don't know about Olympic handball and how accessible it is here in Ireland. Do you think that Irish players, for, for, like, for, say for instance, rugby or, or Gaelic or hurling, do you think that they'd be well suited, suitable and adaptable to definitely, Olympic handball? Definitely, because here you like a lot of sports with a lot of physical contact, and this is a sport that offers you the opportunity to do that. And I'm sure that when they test this, this sport, they will uh, staying with us here. What is the one thing that you would like to take from the two games? What's the most important thing that you would like to come away with? I think the most important has to be at the end of the matches they, they, they have to feel that they give everything that they have on their body. Uh, all, the, all, the, all the strength all that they gave from the, the world the gym mm -hmm. and we, we must be happy with our own job. It's not about the score, it's about uh, our job. Well, best of luck. Okay. So obviously we have this uh, huge week for the association and for the sport at Olympic handball in Ireland. Do you would like to probably explain to people at home? Don't we know that much about how you kind of established? Yeah, it's um, Olympic handball has been around around for quite a while uh, since uh, 1975, I think, as well. It was brought over by a PE teacher from Scotland, um, and it's it's grown over time. There will be a lot of people out there probably playing in school, and that was their one interaction with the sport. Um, but what we've tried to do now is to, to build on that and make it a bit more visible um, in the Irish sports landscape. So this week gives us a great opportunity, you know, biggest games that we've ever hosted, you know, European Championship qualifiers. Um, and that was, I guess, part of the big strategy that we had for the organisation, which was really to take it from a, a minority sport that was kind of, you know, caught in a, in a rush to actually, you know, uh, dreaming big and, and trying to go big uh, with limited resources. Um, so about two years ago, um, we got some support from the European Handball Federation for various development projects. One of those projects was my own role as a general manager and then Lisa Regan, our development officer as well. So I guess we've gone from having say one person in the office who was trying to do everything, Susan, who, who was fantastic, but it was one person trying to do it all on her own, uh, to having now three staff that can actually work well together as a team. So uh, we've had a lot of success in terms of development and you know, bringing more people in and more schools and uh, I think, you know, for people that come to watch the games or people that are looking at results, you really have to bear in mind there's 50 nations in Europe. When we started off, we were ranked 50. Mm -hmm. okay. So the very, very bottom of the rung. And uh, we said, okay, what's achievable for us? People say, are you going to the Olympics? And, you know, that's fantasy land for us. We'd like to go there one day, but right now we want to get from 50 at all. So in the last 18 months, we've gone from 50 to 40 in the European rankings and we've taken some heavy meetings on the way and we're probably going to take some more heavy meetings on the way but what the players understand is we're moving forward every time we take the court it's another step forward in our performance and in our development and uh, like I said they're young so what we're hoping is that five ten years from now we're going to have a very experienced squad play really high level handball and we'll be able to produce big results. So what would you say are the main maybe transferable skills for rugby, or I suppose rugby players, gay players or even basketball players? Yeah, I think so. Like we we looked at this ourselves internally and we thought there, there's definitely athletes out there playing sports to a reasonably high level in Ireland that they're not going to progress any further in mm -hmm. their chosen sport. Um, and we launched this Green Giants talent transfer program for crossover athletes. Um, so far we've had a good bit of success with with two basketball players coming in, Peter Madsen and uh, Brendan Marine both be high level basketball players but at different ends of the spectrum. Peter's at the end of his career in basketball I would say and Brendan was just starting off in his career. But what we found with them is that uh, defensively they're very very good. You know they know about body position and all these kinds of things and how to move themselves about. Uh, they've got great jumping skills you know um, but the ball skills are very different you know so even though they, they love to dribble that we don't want them to do that even though it's part of our game. Yeah. So do, do that as a last resort. With the rugby guys, we find you know physicality, you know very very good, but also awareness of space. You know I think um, being able to create space and keep space is really part of the key part of the game. And I think you find that in any invasion game, around soccer, basketball, rugby. So it, it's it's a transferable skill right across the board. That was the Olympic handball team. Uh, they faced Estonia and Belgium. 
just a matter of about a week ago and unfortunately while not successful the gap has been closing and closing they've moved from 50th in the rankings to 40th in Europe a pretty considerable uh, result over the last couple of months largely due to the fact that the IHA have, I, IOHA have got their act together Eddie O'Sullivan's now involved and they really really have pushed on from there moving on I'm joined by Action 81's Emmett Ryan. Emmett, welcome to the programme. Hi, Bethany. Great to be here. We're going to go through some of the top stories of the week. We're going to start with Gaelic Games and, of course, Dublin today in action in the Alliance National Football League semi-final against Mayo. Yeah, it was a big game today, Bethany. Uh, it was pretty much over by half-time, though, which is unusual given the nature of Gaelic Games scoring, obviously. But uh, Mayo came out to a hot start, got three points early. But once Dublin realised that they could score from long range, they were able to open up Mayo pretty much at will and then started passing well inside. Paul Mannion and Kamuka Croaks had a huge game for, for Dublin. Bernard Brogan had been on the quieter side in his first game back, but that was to be expected because he was coming back after three games on the shelf with injury. So on the whole, very dominant performance. They won 2-16 to 0 16 They were seven points up at the break, and essentially the last 35 minutes was just making sure that Mayo didn't close the gap enough to give them a scare. Yeah, they faced Tyrone in the final. They beat Kildare this morning. A uh, bit of a stronger test from Tyrone? Yeah, I'd expect that very much so. Like, Tyrone have been playing a lot, a lot better than most teams in the league. That's why they got second place overall and, of course, beat Dublin in the regular season. So it's going to be a tough test for Dublin in, in one respect. But there's also injury concerns with Tyrone. Uh, Peter Hart went down injured today. Looks like it's a type of injury that'll knock him out for a few weeks. He could even be at risk of missing the first championship game. If there's any health worry at all with him, he's not playing the league final in two weeks' time. Mickey Hart's going to not prioritise that. His, his priority is going to be Danny Gall in the Ulster Championship. So that would be a big loss for them. And just like in terms of depth, like Dublin have a huge advantage over everybody else. And it's also clearly a greater priority competition for most teams, for Dublin, sorry, than for most teams in it. Will Jim Gavin be bothered about a league title? Is he just happy that they're back playing well, performing well? Oh, primarily, like, yeah, he just wants to performances. Like, but, like, you know, every piece of tin matters uh, in, in many respects. Like, you know, like, well, obviously, if they have a, a bad summer, like, people won't remember the league too well. But if they've got the league title as they're building through the summer, like, you know, it'll, it'll be good for confidence as things go on. If you look at the Cork team a couple of years ago, won the league, then won the championship. The Kerry teams back in the mid 2000s had a couple of league titles before winning championships. It's, it's often a good stepping stone in a, during, in, in a single season before winning the title. Who are the key players that we really need to look out for? Obviously, we've got the old hands, the people we know, the Brian Cullens, the Alan Brogans, who've been around years. Uh, but there's a couple of new names in the Dublin team sheet. The likes of Jack McCaffrey's come through. He exciting new talent? Yeah, McCaffrey's very interesting to watch because he had a, I would say, slow start to the season with Dublin, really. Like, he was being caught a bit off the ball, was probably a little bit too hasty, but his energy is just unreal. Like, and as the season's gone on, he's become a much more mature footballer. And he was leaving Mayo really in, in stitches during the day because it's the angles he runs at. It's not just that he's fast, that he runs at angles which are hard to really read. So he's very good for setting up passes, creating scores. And that makes him a very dangerous player because he doesn't like to attack from the back. Like They play a very expansive game. Like That's pretty obvious to anyone who watches them. They've typically played with seven defenders when they had uh, Pat Gillory in charge. Gavin switched to playing a, a straight-up six-man defence by pushing out Stephen Clucks and the goalkeeper a little bit more, actually. like So he's coming off his line more to try and compensate for that lack of a sweeper. And it, it's made it interesting in terms of like the risk they're taking because, in theory, they should be under more threat under high balls. But Mayo tried a few high balls today, and it was straight man-marking coverage, and Dublin cleaned up. like So seemingly they've worked on their high ball defence in order to be able to get better at this expansive attacking game. Obviously, I'm a culture. I'm not from Dublin originally. Yeah. Um, and nobody outside the capital likes Dublin doing well for whatever reason. Although in 2011 there was a fair amount of goodwill towards them. Um, That's because you were playing Kerry and everybody was sick Kerry winning. <laughs> Are we looking at a Dublin race for Sam this year again? Is uh, it possible? They're definitely one of the top contenders. Like I always say, you don't win anything in spring. Like you know, in terms of the championship, like it's a case of making sure you're not you're not in a bad way going into the championship. Dublin clearly were last summer because even though they got to a semi final. They didn't really have a single good performance in the whole summer, and you could see the problems there going back to spring. And again, it's not necessarily about results, about how they play. Like so, like while Dublin's league record was average, like their performances were really worrying. This year, a lot of good performances, and of course, again, it's more competition for places, which you know is always sort of a nice cliche thing to do. But it's very important to have depth because it's not just about like the motivation of players. It's knowing that when a man goes down, you're not going to be lost. Like we've seen that with Mayo. Andy Moran's been a huge loss for them went down with an ACL injury last summer. They battled through well to get to the LR in final. But you could see, like, so Michael Connery today was playing a lot of ball in the corner, but didn't have someone to work off. He wasn't getting the support. If Would Andy... Conor Mortimer be an asset there? 
honestly, no, they really need a ball winner, like, you know, sort of like Andy Moore, and he's a very good target man. And so someone like that to work off for Conroy would have been a great asset. Like, like Mortimer is a very good footballer, like, you know, an XTCU man like yourself and myself, uh, <laughs> Brefney. But he just doesn't fit the system Horan has. So, you know, it's, to me, it's, not, a, even a, it's a, not even an attitude thing. It's just he's the wrong footballer for the way Mayo play football. OK. Changing codes and looking at rugby, an All-Ireland clash of its, of its own yeah, yesterday evening between Leinster and Munster created a bit of a stir. Uh, well, yeah, there was a certain incident involving... Let's uh, come back to that in a minute. ...involving let's a certain just, player which you won't discuss. Yeah, let's... It's a bit dodgy. Let's look at that And we don't want to get minute. sued. But, like, uh, you know, but I know Andy McGeady on Twitter was really angry about it. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, earlier, uh, good, good sports analyst and runs my fantasy baseball league. But, uh, it's yeah... It's a regular analyst on my radio show. Uh, exactly. So a lot of people wouldn't know him watching this show, but... Uh, like Brian O'Driscoll obviously was 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 a good story if we're going for the yeah for let's the go positives. for the good news story for the good news story Brian O'Driscoll coming back and scoring the winning try because obviously Bod's had his injury issues and there's usual stories about well is he is he going to retire is he not I personally think because of all the retirement stories Brian O'Driscoll's not going to retire just to say to hell with he's going to pick his own time surely. exactly like yeah. yeah he's he's I think he's he's sort of like Kobe Bryant only more likable and that like you know he's going to decide himself when he retires and he's not going to like let the you know hype over when he's retiring going to decide it so great to see him coming back scoring a try and crucially I suppose because the, the league is really what matters to Leinster right now, like much more than the Challenge Cup. They got second place, which uh, they moved back in second place, which is very important when it comes to the playoff time because you want the home semi final. Now, at the moment, they're still probably on course to be a way to get to the final, like which would be a trip to Scotland for a lot of Irish people at this rate, uh, which wouldn't be the worst trip in the world, I have to admit. Like, I like Scotland, but uh, at the same time, like a top two seed is really crucial to Leinster. So, the win last night, very important in that respect. Munster was all about performance, and so it was not losing too badly in that game it was very positive for them, because if you recall their last game before they played a match in Europe, they got absolutely tro- hockeyed. Like, but so then they produced the goods in the th- Heineken they, Cups. They, they did, like, you know, against certain analysts' predictions uh, on television Most last week. Analyst yeah, predictions. Yeah, thank, yeah, I know. But uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, so I'm glad I wasn't alone in that. In that, in that, in that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, though, because, like, again, it's not an easy tie for them in the, in the, in the Heineken Cup. Like, so... I would still not expect them to make it to the Viva for the final myself, like, but of course I was, I've been wrong before in them. Yeah, no, I, I kind of have a sneaking suspicion they could be the fairy tale story of the year. Win it when they're expected to win it, but to win it when they're not expected would be a fantastic result for the Monster. Uh, oh, absolutely, but I just really don't think... I, 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 I was stunned by how hard how Harlequins played that quarter final, like, really, like, and uh, just the Harlequins didn't... I thought Harlequins were going to walk it, to be honest. I didn't even think it was going to be close. That's what, that's what some of you were Was that game. maybe what, what won it for Monster in the end, that the Harlequins probably thought that they'd walk it too? Yeah, I think there was definitely a bit of overconfidence, because it, it's happened before as well, like, because... Quinn's in the stoop, like they feel it's more of a home venue than it really is because the Quinn's crowd is good, but like it's not exactly a fortress. Like, you know, they, they, the thing is, like, that club has come around an awful lot, like, because the way they won the Premiership last year, great rugby team, like, the way they, the way they, they and really showed great resolve to with hope, withstand with Leicester comeback in the final. So, I was thinking, this is a team with the mental strength to beat the whole, like, you know, stuff it up to jump or stuff of Munster, like, you know, and all the usual heroic stuff you hear with them. They, that they were beyond having to worry about dealing with that. Clearly, I was wrong in that respect, at least on this occasion. Okay. Are we going to mention the, uh, the incident? Well, let's not get sued. <laughs> okay, let's, let's jump on from that. Uh, moving on to, I suppose, another uh, football code, uh, soccer and the Eritricity League. Uh, it's been a fantastic start of the season for Sligo Rovers. It really has. I was just uh, checking off air before we came on. They're, they've, I don't know who they're joint with, but they've, set, they've matched the record for the best ever start for a team in the Premier Division with eight, eight straight wins. And the last team to do, well, actually, sorry, I'm not sure it's the best ever start, but sorry, they, if, if they go on to win the title, sorry, it'll have been matching the best ever start of a team that won the title, sorry, just to clarify that. So the best... So it's very early to be talking about title winning. It is, but, but like when you're racking up points start. at that rate, like, you know, you know they're, they're, they're going to be hard to rein in, like, because even at the quarter pole nearly, like, and they're already starting to put a bit of breathing room between themselves and the pack. And like they're going to drop points, obviously, and they're, pr- they're going to drop them probably in the next couple of weeks. Like, but to be ha- have the cushion early, like it, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, no. Are you, are you certain they're going to drop points? Uh, yeah, p- purely because I think they've got a bit of a fixture load coming. I think between uh, as well, like it's more a case of like there will be a bit of a fixture pile up for them. I think myself, and that means there's just going to be the odd place here and there where they're probably going to have to like you know drop some points. Like you know, obviously yourself, you're a UCD fan for your sins. Yeah, yeah, not a How's great. How's the season gone for you so far? Well, like I heard someone comparing it to 2009 on uh, Friday night, which is worrying because 2009 UCD played an exceptionally bad season in Premier Division, came last and looked awful in every game. Now they haven't looked as bad, and of course they remarkably are still only one win away from being outside the relegation zone, which is, tells, tells you how bad the, the, the bottom end of the league really is, but still only one point from eight games. Like So, lost to a St. Pat's team who the Pats fans themselves would, would, would admit aren't a great side this year, but Pats were still clearly the class above UCD in that match. Both teams played horribly. 
Uh, but I suppose like the real stunner for me was the way Shelburne lost you on Friday night to Drogheda, because Shells were goal up for most of that game against against Drogheda United, and then went down three one. Like uh, Drogheda really came from behind, and for the teams in the relegation zone, that's a huge result because Drogheda aren't going down. Shells are a team who's in danger, so them dropping points at the same rate as the other teams, like so that's Gray will be a bit more relieved despite losing seven nil and Tala to Rovers. Uh, like they're sort of results where you know you're thinking one of your rivals might pick up points, and then. You know, they, they, they just they find a way to lose, basically. Yeah, who are your tip to kind of get the European spots? I know it's very early in the season, but who, who's impressed you so far this season? Uh, well, Derry, and not just because of their performance in Belfield when a hockey DCD, like, you know, that's, that's easy enough to do, like, at the moment. But uh, Derry do look like a really good organised team. Like, you'd worry about, like, what will happen to them if they get any injuries, though, because I don't know beyond a starting 11 if they have the players, really, at the moment. Like, Shamrock Rovers, naturally, beyond starting 11, are actually reasonably deep. So they're a team, you think... When other teams have injury problems, they'll pick up the points, and that'll definitely get them into European contention. And after that, it's kind of, you know, it's a pot luck almost at that, after that, like, to be honest. Looking at the first division, it's something that not a lot of pundits do. Longford seem to be the, the form team. There's, I noticed a very familiar name in their starting 11. He also managed to get himself his marching orders the other night. Uh, Keith Gillespie, formerly of Newcastle. Man yes, United. yeah, he's 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 there, and uh, of course Longford have you know got got their problems at the moment off the field with the investigation, which they've been very heavily involved in themselves, like they were part of the uncovering. So for them to begin the results on the field is, is obviously a great sign, and uh, like yeah, Keith Gillespie, like he's knocked around, he played a bit of Irish league with Glentoran as well, like you know he's he, he's not the young man he used to be though, so he's he's relying on his, his guile and his wit more than his pace at this stage, uh, but yeah, the first division is kind of strange because. There's no one particularly standing out as being the team that everyone's going to beat up on this year because everybody's beating up on, on each other from what I've seen from the results in the first division this year, which it really means if a front runner can get out early, there's not going to be that much room for someone to, to, to take them back. So like, if, if, if anything, the first division is, there, is really built for a front runner this year because there's no team that's going to really give up early that'll be soft points down the stretch. So if you've got a nice uh, you know, back end of the schedule. So really, it gets really set up for a team to just go out early and like you know wrap it up like Waterford did a few years back. I recall, like you know. So. Okay, in hockey, the Irish Hockey League kicked off last week. I know you're not a big hockey follower, yeah. uh, but have you been out to the uh, the Belfield Park at all? Yeah. Uh, the National Hockey Stadium in Belfield. Yeah. I, I I've only been been to it on the way on the way on the way onto the bowl to be honest. But yeah, no, it's 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 interesting the way hockey's set up as well in the country because I'm guessing a lot of people wouldn't be aware. It starts off at provincial leagues and then you qualify from those to get into the national league, which went off over six weeks after that. Yeah. Yeah, you qualify for the year ahead, so yeah. this year's participants will be uh, have qualified during last year's provincial competitions. Yeah. Uh, in the men's competitions, there's three teams on beaten record. Uh, Monkstown, Cookstown and Barnbridge are setting the pace in mm. that division at the moment. I know Loretto are uh, setting the pace in the women's competition. There's a couple of teams then on, uh, on two wins from the first three games. I know UCD have two wins, as do Railway Union, who we're going to be coming back to later on in the show and uh, having a little chat with them after their Senior Cup victory a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, yeah, hockey is kind of booming at the moment. Uh, of course, we had two near misses when it came to Olympic qualification last year, but that, that we weren't even in the discussion in any previous Olympiads in my, in my lifetime or yours, Breffney, is the thing. And like the, the reason for that is basically we've put the investment in, the players are now able to focus much more on their hockey when they're playing, like especially the, the top level players. Uh, the National League is kind of an interesting format as well because obviously it's a very short schedule overall. So every defeat is that much more like damaging to your overall chances of taking the title. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose finally, a quick look at the Masters. Uh, it's been a bit of controversy, but some nice golf played as well. Yeah, Tiger Woods had it was nearly DQ'd over dropping, uh, over, 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 over a misplayed drop. You say nearly DQ'd. He broke the rules. Yeah, and for some reason they didn't disqualify him. And, and, and it's, it's interesting even the way this has played out because uh, yesterday Nick Faldo was screaming you know, on the Golf Channel in America that like, you know, Tiger Woods has to be disqualified. And then today he was saying, actually, no, I think they're right not to disqualify him. So clearly somebody had a word at Sir Nick like, you know, on that. Absolutely. Uh, Lindsay Vaughn's husband, well, sorry, ex-husband, was saying some uh, witty, and I will say not dirty, witty things on Twitter. I forgot the exact phrase he was using, but he was talking about, like, you know, but, well, I know all about finding cheaters like, you know, around Tiger Woods and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's creative with that. But of course, like, the fun part is really to me that, like, uh, uh, Guan uh, Chan Lung, and I'm har uh, horrible in the pronunciation of his surname, I'm sure, secured the silver trophy today by finishing his round. So that's great for the 14 year old, like best finished amateur at the Masters. So delighted for him, especially given the drama he had by nearly, you know, he the slow play, the slow play incident, which, uh, you know, he was very mature as well in how he dealt with it. He said, they call it, that's how I see it, I can do anything about it, I just hope to make the cut. Like, he was very straightforward about that. So, really, you know, smart young man. Like, you know, it's great to see him doing that. 
it's still all to play for. Like just, just before we came on air, I know Angel Cabrera had a one-shot lead, but it's uh, very close in the top three in the Masters right now. Okay, I am going to ask you about Basketball Ireland. There has been a bit of a furore in the last week or two about incidents dating back to the uh, historical uh, yeah. Basketball Ireland uh, committee, effectively, where money was awarded for a contract and then uh, was misspent, misappro yeah. not misappropriated, but misspent on other aspects of development of the sport. Um, they've been issued with fines and bans from applying for capital funding. What's yeah, your take on like, that? To me, the bigger part is, is a ban. Well, essentially, it's a, it's a problem that other organizations have had it before, and it, it's very clear like a capital grant from the Sports Council has to be spelled in ca spent on capital projects. Like That's because they are a hugely different amount of money to, your, right, to the regular annual grant you get. Like So like it, they have to enforce this very strictly. Like, so, and To be fair, most of the uh, current Basketball Iron Committee actually agreed with the findings. The fine is severe, uh, 124 grand. Like, you know, like, I don't have that lying around. I'm guessing you don't either. No. And like most of all, no, I don't. Like, yeah, it's, it's amazing how little money you make off selling books, Brefney. <laughs> but uh, like, you know, that'll be hard for them to, to pay you back, but that's manageable. Like, you can do, you, there are ways to make that much money up if you're a national sporting body. The real killer for them is the five year ban on applying for capital grants because, like, anyone involved in Irish basketball will tell you the national stadium needs work done on it. They just simply do not have the means now to apply for the money. Pardon me to do that for the next five years. So it's going to take something extraordinary to find a way to do any development on the site for at least five years, because obviously after you put into application, there's a wait process. So you're talking yeah. seven, eight years possibly before they can do any serious work in the stadium. Okay, well, listen, thanks very much for joining us. Obviously, Emmett Ryan from Action 81 blog, also a book out. Uh, the Tactics Not Passion, available now at originalwriting.ie. <laughs> he, he did mention it in the piece, so we might as well give him an opportunity <laughs> to plug it. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to a new segment, and we are looking now at... One individual, I took a time out during the week to have a chat with one very inspirational person. His name is Jerry Duffy and you may have heard of him. He completed 32 marathons in 32 days back in the summer of 2010 and then followed that up in 2011 by a deck Ironman. I'm going to let him tell you what that's all about. It's been three months since the start of Sporting Spotlight and now we've added a video feature to the show. The first person up in our video Sporting Spotlight is none other than Mr. Iron Man himself, Jerry Duffy. Jerry, welcome to the program. Thanks indeed, Brefton. Great to be here. Jerry, people will be very familiar with you. You've got a lot of exposure over the last few years in terms of your 32 Marathon Challenge, your Deck Endure Man Challenge, and some of the other crazy and, and wonderful things you've done over the last few years. First, talk to us about your childhood in Mullingar and I suppose up to your early 20s or late 20s. I went to school, uh, secondary school in Mullingar, but ironically boarding school. and. Uh, in boarding school, I played a lot of sports in school. Um, you know, big into football, hurling, pitch and putt. There was a pitch and putt course. It was a boarding school that had its own pitch and putt course, and, and uh, there was wonderful facilities in the school, and, and I embraced it all. Suddenly, I was 27, and what I'd realised from 17 until 27 is I'd stopped, with the exception of one exercise, of which was playing golf, because I loved playing golf. Uh, I didn't do any exercise at all, and I just became conscious of this at 27 because I saw a photograph of myself and I suddenly realised, and maybe I knew it all along, but I suddenly realised that I, I was now four and a half stone heavier than when I left boarding school. Tell us about that photograph. <coughs> the other person in the photograph with you was uh, the well-known golfer Sevi Ballesteros, one of your childhood idols. But you had a, an epiphany that day, it was your road to Damascus, when you got that photograph developed. I was so excited because I got to meet my hero two days before and this was my, my childhood hero. I met him in the flesh. The week before, he was over in Ireland playing golf in the Irish Open in Mount Juliet, down in Kilkenny. Got the photograph developed, so excited, couldn't wait to show my friends. Took it out, outside the pharmacy, and stared at it. And it was like somebody, it was like looking in the mirror. And I said to myself, Jerry, you're better than this. So you bought yourself a pair of runners and hit the roads. How hard was that first run? The first day I went running, I can still picture it. Uh, beautiful, sunny morning. I was always a morning person. Going to boarding school had instilled that into me. The very first run, I went for three miles. And I was actually able for it. But the, the overriding, it was a beautiful, sunny morning. I distinctly remember that. I can remember where I went, where I lived at the time, who I shared lodgings with and all of that. And I came back. But in reality, the only thing that was uppermost in my mind was how quickly can you get home to have a cigarette? I was still a smoker. I gave up cigarettes six months after that. Uh, but the first run, I came back and I genuinely did enjoy it, I have to say. Uh, I got those positive endorphins, that serotonin connection between two brain cells that, 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 that makes us happy. And I got that. And uh, I embraced it straight away. I took to running, literally, I used to run three or four times a week for three or four miles. So your first entry into the world of competitive running, you were 
cajoled into taking part in a triathlon? Yeah, my brother rang me in 2004 and he said, uh, do you want to take part in a triathlon? And this is only nine years ago. And my exact reply to him was, what's a triathlon? I didn't even know what it was at the time. And he explained it involved swimming, cycling and running. And it was, whilst triathlon had been there for 10 or 15 years, it was only very slowly starting to emerge as something that Irish people en masse were becoming aware of. Uh, and he explained what it involved. And I said, you know, I was into running at this stage. I was up to maybe up to a couple of hours of running at this stage because I've been running for eight or nine years. But purely quietly and privately on the canals or trails or roads around Mullingar. And uh, it took him three phone calls to persuade me to, to sign up. So eventually I signed up, but I did it on condition that I could do it as part of a relay team because I didn't actually think I had the ability to, to swim, cycle and run collectively or continually for an hour and a half. Our times have changed. Our times have changed. Uh, but I went and I did it. I did a swim because I figured, well, I, I know I can do the run, do something different, and did a swim, and I just instantly bought into it. It was the competitive end of it because I tried to do it as quickly as possible because it was a part of a team. And uh, getting out of the lake, I said, God, that's just the most incredible feeling. And I vowed that I would do the full thing the next year, but I didn't. I, it was two years before I did my first full uh, triathlon. But that was my first introduction to it—a 15-minute swim. Ironically, that I thought it then was the limit of my ability. Fast forward a couple of years, and a thought came to you of run mm. 32 marathons in 32 days, consecutive days in 32 counties across the country. You said yourself you were up to a couple of hours uh, a week. What had you got? What had brought you from the three miles uh, as a heavy smoker to that stage? I suppose by this stage I was up to 10, 12 miles of running or whatever it was, and. Uh, I always wanted to do a marathon and had this burning ambition. Every year in October, I used to regret on Bank Holiday Monday not doing the Dublin City Marathon. Every year for 20 years I said, you know, you could do that, you should do that, you want to do that, but you haven't done that. So maybe you could do that. And so I signed up for the Dublin City Marathon um, and I trained hard for that. And I did it. And I had a, funny enough, I had a wonderfully horrendous experience because it's the one and only time it's ever happened to me, but we hear of marathon runners hitting the wall. And it's the one and only time I've ever hit the wall, but ironically I look back on it now as probably one of the best things that ever happened in sport. Because I learned such a valuable lesson that I never forgot it. And uh, I really, I hit the wall at 18 miles, give or take. I'm quite interested in this because you talk about this in, in your first book, Who Dares Runs. And no man came out of the, the crowd as you were hitting the wall in the marathon. Tell us about that. Yeah, what happened was I started off full of enthusiasm and I genuinely had trained very, very hard for it. I didn't leave anything behind in training. But what I didn't know at the time was that there was that you had to pace yourself. And I said, you know, I did the first mile in a minute quicker than the projected time. I had a projected finishing time at the time of three and a half hours. And I, I worked out roughly what that would equate to, but I had limited knowledge even at this stage. And the first mile I did it at rough approximately a, a minute quicker. I said, this is easy. And then I did the second mile, and then I did the fifth mile, and the eighth mile, and the tenth mile, all at this pace. But it was around 12, 13, 14 miles that suddenly I was starting about to serve this major learning or major apprenticeship because my body was now starting to ask questions of, how did you treat me in mile one and three and five and seven? Because the jury, just to let you know, you actually went too fast, and now we're about to treat you with the same respect that you treated us. You know, I'm speaking purely metaphorically, I guess, but um, 12, 13, 14 miles, I could slowly start to feel my body leaking in terms of energy and, and pain was starting to creep in. And by the time I got to 18 miles, I literally had stopped. I was absolutely exhausted and literally was really struggling, literally to put one foot in front of the other. And I remember uh, stopping, and this man literally just... There was people all around, because Dublin City Marathon was an incredibly wonderful experience. To, to crowds everywhere, people everywhere. And we were so, somewhere um, around the Milltown, uh, generally the Milltown area, escaping exactly where it happened now. But um, I do remember that, that the... I think it was Roebuck Road you mentioned Robert in the Road, book. Yeah, at 18 miles. Yeah. And the route is slightly different now. Uh, they, they changed it the following year. Uh, just made a bit of a change. But um, they, they, this old man literally just, he was literally standing right beside me because I literally stopped to let, because other runners wanted to continue and I just literally stopped. And he just put his arm around me and just whispered into my ear and he said something 
that I'd never forgot. He said, uh, don't worry. He said, uh, they're all feeling it. He said, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and I guarantee you'll reach the finish. A couple of years later, um, 32 marathons. Why would you even consider doing something like that? What happened, briefly, was I had done the marathon with a view to doing an Ironman transfer the following year. And when I, I, I got this idea to do a, an Ironman about eight or ten months before the marathon, and I said, well, you, if you're going to do an Ironman, you haven't done a marathon. Maybe a marathon would be a good stepping stone to get that experience. So what I did was I went, and that's why I did the marathon. And then I went for a year, and I trained to do an Ironman distance transfer, which is the equivalent of 160 lengths of a pool. You cycle roughly from, I guess, from city centre of Dublin to Loch Ray in County Galway, and then you run the equivalent of the Dublin City Marathon at the end of that, and that's what roughly what an Ironman is. And uh, I went and I did one of those, and about a week after that, I, I met a chap who has since become a very close friend called Ken Whitelaw, and Ken came to me for advice because he wanted to do a marathon a year later, and he came to my office and we chatted. And uh, when he was leaving, he just threw a book on the table and he said, I hear you're into doing, I was doing all kinds of really long stuff at this stage. And he said, you'll really enjoy this book. It's about an adventure runner. And I read the book and out of the book, I just got this idea to run consecutive marathons. And I said, okay, what would be consecutive marathons? What would be very unique? And I figured, well, why not do one in, one in every county on the island of Ireland? And that was an idea I conceived in, I think it was September of 2008. How did your body cope with that? With 30 Americans, we trained savagely hard. Ken came on board and, and uh, we literally trained. Like we were doing up to four and a half Americans a week in training, you know, three, four, five months out. And people say, how do you do 30 Americans in 32 days? Well, we were doing back-to-back Americans on weekends, you know, five o'clock in the morning, going out and running for four or five hours on our feet, doing 31 mile training runs, this kind of thing. Also, nutrition and rest and physio and psychology was such a big part of it. What would you back up and support in that? One of the things I've learned roughly, is, is you know, to achieve any goal, and I guess the more challenging goal, the more we need to do it, is to surround yourself with great people. And we surrounded ourselves with a wonderful crew. Um, in terms of the physical challenge, we obviously had a chartered physio on board, we had a food scientist who was also an ultra runner and a, an elite ultra runner. Um, our training program was designed by a professional ultra runner. Um, so we had all these incredible people around us at, Obviously, you know, through programs or through phone calls or through training sessions or whatever. But we began the journey on the 2nd of July 2010. And we were very respectful of the fact that, okay, day one, day two, we had to be thinking of day 31 and day 32 because at, on day 25, our bodies were going to say, well, how would you look after me three weeks ago? Because we were. Out. So this is kind of a, a bigger version of hitting the wall on the first march? Yeah, and, and I'd learned that, that pacing is so important. So the first day we ran a very conservative, uh, we did it in 4.39, I think. And interestingly enough, at, at mile 18, both of us actually felt a little bit sore, but what we realised very within a mile or two was the fact that we had tapered for three weeks leading into it, where we just significantly dropped our, our workload. So our bodies, had, to a tiny degree, had forgotten what it was like to do a long run. Um, so, but... Uh, Day two, day three, day four, we always hover around the four and a half hour mark. Coming on from the 32 marathons, that's done, dusted, in the locker, can't be taken away. Ridiculous amount of money collected for a fantastic charity. You had another brainwave and you decided, you know what, that's just not enough. I want another challenge. And you picked what is the subject of your new book, which is uh, Tick Top 10. It's in bookshops this week. I have it in my hands now, but I haven't had a chance to read it. It's about your challenge, your next challenge, which was to participate in the Deca Enduroman. Now, for our listeners, maybe just tell us what the Deca Enduroman is. I, I did some research on the internet and I found an event called a Deca Iron Distance Triathlon, which, by its very definition, I suppose, is a 10 day event. Uh, it's the equivalent of an Iron Distance Triathlon each day. So, now put that into context for us, okay? You spoke about going from uh, swimming from from Dublin to, to various places. How far are we talking in deck armour? The swim distance was the equivalent of swimming from the city centre in Dublin to Drogheda, County Down. So that's roughly 24 miles. The uh, run distance is from exactly almost to the mile from Belfast down to Cork, and uh, which is 262 miles. And the cycle that we had to do was, and I've actually checked this out, uh, as the crow flies, literally from the runway, 
at Dublin Airport to the runway at Malaga Airport in the south of Spain, which is 1160 miles. I think it's actually 1159, truth be told, but maybe that's to one the short end of the runway. But, but there was a contact. Argue, I mean, yeah, we're talking about those kind of figures. Uh, one or two is not going to be a major issue. Yeah, but that was that was that's the collective distances that were involved. The book hit the shops this week. Uh, congratulations, second book. The first one was an absolute bestseller. A bit of a slow grower, but once it, it, it stayed in the bestseller list for ages. Um, you hoping for more of the same? Hopefully. Uh, the one thing you know, the event is almost two years ago now. But I, just, I started writing this about six months after the DECA. I, great, uh, I was able to retrieve great detail because of the audio that I'd done. And I said to myself, you know, I just want to give it a, a very detailed account of the event. And not just to share my experience, but what I've done is I've gone and I've interviewed five other competitors and the organisers and the doctor that was involved as well. So I've got an insight from eight or nine different perspectives of different experiences different motivations for being involved or, or, or for doing the event. And so I've told a lot of different stories in the book about other people's motivation for being there. And it took me, what was it, from January of, of 2012 to, to literally now, to literally finished three weeks ago, uh, of writing. And, and I thought, you know, in August I was getting near the end of the first draft. And yet since August I've been a minimum of 20 hours on it every week, so I, I was far from finished. I know, because we spoke about it last uh, September, where it was a couple of weeks from being finalised, and uh, here it is now. It's already in the shops, people should run out and buy it as soon as they can. Uh, and if you're going to buy it, you may as well stop in the sports shop on the way home and pick up a new pair of runners as well. Uh, it's going to get people out running. Jerry, it's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks very much for coming in and having a chat with us. Best of luck with the book. Uh, and just. TikTok pen for those of you uh, who haven't had a chance to read it yet, get out and buy it in a copy. All good bookshops. Hugely inspirational story. Anyone who's watching should make it their business to get to one of your talks and uh, and find out a little bit more about you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. And that was Jerry Duffy uh, speaking to me earlier in the week and his new book, TikTok 10, is out in all good bookshops. Now, I can't recommend it highly enough. Hugely inspirational guy. I have to say, like a lot of people must be able to relate to that at that age, after college and school is finished, you know, uh, work and family commitments just take over and sport gets dropped by the wayside. Everything gets dropped by the wayside. People just prioritise their families, their work, and they wake up 28, 30 years of age and they're like, I need to do something about it. And there's one example of someone who did a fantastic job. Uh, his first book, which uh, we mentioned off air earlier, Who Dares Runs, absolutely fantastic read. It'll make you want to go out and buy a pair of runners and get pounding the miles. I uh, can't recommend it highly enough. As I said, both books, go out and get them as soon as you can. We are now changing tack a little bit, and we did mention it slightly earlier in the programme. The recent Irish Senior Hockey Cup in women's was won by Railway Union Hockey Club. Myself and a couple of the crew went down to Railway in Sandymount to have a chat with the coach and some of the girls. trying to win the Senior Cup for years. Um, we lost in the final once. Um, this is probably my last season with the club and it's the only trophy we've not won to date. So it sort of completes the full set for us. So absolutely delighted. If I had to choose one trophy to win this year, it would have been the, the Senior Cup. So. Yeah, it's an absolutely incredible feeling to have won the Irish Senior Cup last weekend. Um, we won the Jackie Potter the week before, but I mean, winning an, an All-Ireland trophy is, it means a lot more to us, to be honest with you. And we've been competing on the Irish stages now for the last three or four years under Mick McKinnon. And um, we've managed to kind of um, gain two IHLs under him, but we really wanted the Irish Senior Cup from this time. Railway Union is, is as you say, it's a multi-sports club. Um, the cricket section have been very successful here. Um, Kevin O'Brien, who's one of the top players in, in world cricket now, um, is here and, and that acts as an inspiration to some of the girls. He's, uh, his girlfriend is manager of the team um, and uh, our men's section won the national 
crew, which obviously uh, gave us something to, to, to aspire to. It's a title we've won before as well. Um, so yeah, it's, re it's really good. And, and, and to, be, to be part of a club that, um, two years ago we hosted the European Championships here, and the whole club put together, the soccer section, the rugby section, everyone, um, and uh, it's a fantastic place to be. Started and I was in the Colts. We have there's a Colts section here and they play every Sunday. So I played kind of every Sunday. I was very eager when I was that age. And uh, then I just grew up through the Colts really. And then when you hit around 16, you're able to play for the first division. It's an incredible club, really, to be honest with you. As you can see in the background, maybe there's cricket, there's soccer, um, rugby, and hockey. There's a lot going on down here, even though maybe it might be known as a small community. There's a lot happening. Um, the hockey community down here is really welcoming. I'm only here six years now in the club, but from the minute you come in here, there's just a warm atmosphere. We're, we're blessed to have the lovely clubhouse, which was renovated when we hosted the Europeans two years ago. So, um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic atmosphere socially and then obviously on the pitch as well. younger I was about maybe 15, 16 and going to watch like, I don't know who would have been, could have been Pegasus or a team like that, like a really brilliant team at that time and I always thought our railway will never get to an RC Cup final because we were like probably the bottom of the first division and we weren't very good and I, I never really, I always wanted to get to a final obviously but I never thought that it could be possible that we'd win it when I was that age obviously but um, then Mick kind of joined the club and we developed and we kept you know, developing the team and we got a lot stronger and better and started winning things kind of in his first two years or so and then he stayed with the club and we just kind of got better and better. The IHL is another big focus for us this season. Um, we, we won it last year so we're really looking to um, retain it this year. Um, it's, it's a big tournament, tough matches now over the next few weeks. It's running right through April with the finals weekend in the first weekend of May. So we're hoping to be in that finals weekend in May. We, there are a lot of tough teams, Loretto, Pegasus, at Ulster Elks, um, Hermes, Catholic Institute, I can't remember. But there are a lot of top teams in there from around the country. So yeah, it'll be tough, but we're, we're hoping to be in the finals weekend. Hockey League is very special to us. It was the first Irish trophy we won in 2010 and uh, we won it back last year, 2012. So it would be a lovely way to go out and win the double. Um, we're in a really tricky pool. All four semi finalists from last year are in the, pool, the same pool this year, um, based upon sort of last year's provincial league finishes. Um, but Irish Hockey have changed that as of next year and it'll be based upon Irish Hockey League finishes in the future. But it's going to be a tough pool. Um, but really looking forward to it. I, I see it as it being in a very good state. Um, we just appointed two new national coaches. Um, both our national teams have been improving uh, over the years um, to reach a stage where hopefully in the future they can challenge at world events. Um, it's, it's in a good state, there's a lot of good young players coming through, so it's exciting time. strong players staying in railway because uh, you see a lot of kind of clubs with their players kind of moving to other clubs or going to college and going to college teams but we seem to have kind of a good solid kind of background of players that wanted to stay in the club and they went through and yeah I think Mick also was a big reason why we did so well he's a very good coach and then we had we've had a few different assistant coaches throughout the years but They've just been able to develop the younger players as well. We have a few younger players coming through and the cult section is very good. And a huge congratulations to the girls. 
And this weekend, they've gone on to win two of their matches to give them a chance to retain the cup uh, from this season. Yep, uh, the Irish Hockey League back in railway, possibly at the end of the season. And a great bunch of girls. Uh, we had a great time down there filming with them. So fingers crossed they're on to a winning streak. Now, next up, the triathlon. Possibly the greatest physical endurance in sport. On the other hand, the tavern triathlon is just a game we've invented to torment Irish athletes. First, we, first up, this week's victim is Olympic triathlete Gavin Noble. We decided we were going to have some sort of a quirky look at how athletes behave when they're not doing what we see them doing day in, day out on our TV screens. What we decided to do was pick three pub games and get a different person in every week to do it. Our first guest is Gavin Noble, Irish Olympic triathlete. Gavin, welcome to the programme. No, thanks for having me. We decided in your honour we were going to call this part of the show Tavern Triathlon. Thank you very much. I feel honoured. Do you know what you have in store for you today? I'm expecting swimming, cycling, and a little bit of running. It's completely different. Well, first of all, let's have a little bit of a chat about yourself. The London Olympics is the pinnacle of my sport, so it's obviously um, a great experience, uh, not only for me, but for family, friends, um, also I guess for the development of triathlon in Ireland, it's good to have two, two athletes there for the first time. Um, so yeah, overall for me it was a positive experience and um, something I look, I look back on with fond memories and I also look to the future um, to improve and uh, hopefully uh, four years time Rio um, and also with it. You led the race at one stage in 2012. Leading the race at, at parts of the parts of a, a triathlon is nothing, um, I wouldn't say it's new. Um, at the end of the day you're racing the same 50 guys week in week out, it just happens to be in the Olympics and there's a lot more people uh, watching but you know that was just part of my, it wasn't that I um, don't do that normally or it's, it's just part of the development of the race, I, my, my running um, was hampered all year by an injury and so I needed the strongest swim bike and that was my game plan um, I knew I wasn't going to run uh, much faster than, than 32 minutes had it been a slower fast bike so I need to keep the pace on and, and that's why you saw me in the front, I had to go to the front to, to make sure that I was um, racing only 23, 24 boys at the end of the backstage rather than the 55 guys who started, so that was my, my tactic. And, um, yeah, look, I, I, I led for a small portion and it was good that people remember, remember that, I guess, and then people look back on it when they get them something to shout about, so yeah, it was a positive experience for me. When you come back from that injury and you recover and look towards Rio, can we look at the same kind of strength on this? Or swim with a bike, and maybe with a quicker run, are we looking at maybe a, a top 10 finish, or is that asking too much? Yeah, sure, my swim and bike has always been my, my strength. Um, like I haven't run since probably since February, so if I, if I look back on it, you might think of what, what might have been like a six months off running. Um, got to hamper you, and of course it is. I, I, I was able to run short, fast sets with um, some taping and some, some painkillers, but I wasn't able to do just the, just the general grind and the miles, and that's what you miss when you come off the bike after an hour and 20 minutes you miss those long winter miles and those long miles so look it's always it's always a case of what what should have could have would have so I don't like to look at it that way and obviously I look to improve my run just over the next four years as I've been looking to improve my run every year. Well obviously we are well used to taking part in three different disciplines on one day which leads us perfectly to what you're here today to do. You're going to be playing darts, pool and answering a few sports questions. How are you going to think you're going to fare out? Not very confident. Why not? Surely you're used um, to this kind of change in the pace of competition. Normally, now if I go to a public house, um, there's maybe a little bit of drink involved. I'm not very good at the drink, so I wouldn't be. Um, that would bring my confidence up because there's obviously no drinking involved today because I'm a you're athlete. Training. Yeah, obviously. Um, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I can't say that I'm going to be good at any one, any three of the events. But who, who, who wants to play with someone who's good at darts or good at pool? Okay, well, I, I would go for the sympathy vote myself if I might. Uh, and I might like do one of these. Two okay, things. well, let's see how you get on.
person that doesn't know what Which Electricity League Club was Roy Keane's first senior club? Cork. Cove Ramblers. They're from Cork. It's not, it's not Cork City though. Which two boxers yeah. fought in the Rumble in the Jungle? Uh, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman. Correct. Name three Irish snooker world champions. Ken Doherty, Dennis Taylor. No, Alex Higgins is the third option. But then the home grounds of the four Irish pops. Uh, the showgrounds in Galway. No. East. <laughs> what? The sports grounds in Galway. Oh, no. <laughs> Twice. Uh, oh man, I know this. I know where they all are. I know where they all are. I know how to get to them. I don't need answers. There's one in Dublin. Correct. One in Limerick. Correct. What's the one in Belfast? Yep, I need names. Alright, uh, this is really far. Time up uh, Raven Hill, oh, no. Tolman Park, and I would have taken the RDS for Leinster. Question five uh, Name the last five UEFA Champions League winners. Individual clubs. So, so I say, yes, 2012. Barcelona. 2011. Inter Milan. 2010. Barcelona? No, it's the last five clubs. So Barcelona did win it in 2012. Oh, right, okay. It's the last five clubs to win it. Real Madrid? Nope. One more answer. Real Madrid last won it in 2002. Manchester? Correct. 2008. The other uh, answer was AC Milan who won it in 2007. So Gavin, 273 total, happy with that? Happy because um, obviously the swim on the bike is still to come. Um, <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. No, 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 no we're done. done. That was the three events over. Ah, right. Yeah. I received myself oh, okay. for the last two events. Let's see. Uh, rookie mistake. We rookie mistake. mistake. We can, you can come back again and do some other. Oh, that's a little bit worse than that. Does look a bad episode. It's fantastic. This one will be talking to you again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs> what a brilliant sport. Gavin Noble, thank you very much for being our first guinea pig. But Brefney, do tell, how does it all work? Well, it's very simple. We picked three sports that we felt would represent what most people would have get up to in a pub. So a pub quiz to finish, but darts and pool, everyone's played it at some point in the pub. So you got whatever score you got in nine darts, which in theory you can finish a darts game in, you keep. Uh, you get 30 points for every ball you pot in the pool, and it's 90 if you get the black. And then questions, we had uh, five questions, first one had one answer, then two, then three, then four, and the final one had five answers, and you got 20 points for every question. So you can get around about 1,000 points in theory. 273 is probably going to be a bit lower on the scale, uh, but still, Gavin, a, a great sport to come along. We do have some pretty good uh, ones of those already in shot, so it's going to be fun to see how people get on we'll over the next few weeks. We'll have to get yourself up, Breffney, now. <laughs> no, I tried. No, it's not going to happen, absolutely not going to happen. Well, I look forward to seeing the coming weeks then, and, and thank you for all our participants. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can get in touch with the show. Absolutely. To find out more, check out uh, sundaysportshow.com, and we're also on Facebook and Twitter, so do feel free to send us a mail, tweet, post, whatever you feel like to, uh, to get involved and, and invite us along to your club.
Absolutely, we are looking to cover the full spectrum of sporting activity across the city. So whether your sport is tiddlywinks or Aikido or anything else, please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you and we'd love to feature you, your club or your sport on the show over the next few weeks. Claire, this has been our, f our first show on the station. Um, it's something we hope to continue throughout the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much for being with us for this week. Thank you. Uh, to Emmett, who joined us earlier, to go run through the weekend's action, and to the entire crew and everyone at the station. Uh, it's been fantastic bringing you uh, this, this week, and we hope to be back with you next week. Hopefully see you then.